Good afternoon. This is something you've all seen before. You put this up, 0.27 seconds later, you get a number of hits. Information. Before Google can present you information, somebody had to discover it. It was a scientific discovery somewhere. Today what I'd like to talk to you a little bit about our scientific discoveries and how we pull them into action and why pulling them into action is so important. A map of the world. In the North Temperate Zone, we have 94% of the great universities of the world. But as, as you can see, 80% of the biodiversity is located in the tropical zone. This is what brought me to Panama. It's what brought me to the tropics. It's where the action is. It's where the action is philosophically. It's where the action is intellectually. It's where the action is socially. This is where you're going to see change. For human well-being, we're going to need to understand the tropics we're going to need to better understand them. We're going to need to understand how to pull science into action as we go from 7 billion to 9 billion people. Panama is a remarkable spot. It's in the tropics. I'm not going to talk about Panama other than to say that because there's Panama and because the Smithsonian is here, because the canal is here, we're in a spot that has global relevance. Not just tropical relevance, but, but global relevance. You're all familiar with the Panama Canal and the great engineering feat that it was. We're about to celebrate 100 years of that engineering feat. But many of you, although Katin would not be one of them because he just talked about it, would probably forget about the fact that Carlos Finlay, a Cuban scientist, a Cuban physician, was the person who in 1881 recognized that mosquitoes were the vectors, the carriers of yellow fever. 1881. That date should resonate because it's the date when the French started the construction of the Panama Canal. They ultimately didn't succeed and they didn't, their, their failure did not owe to engineering. It owed to yellow fever and malaria. 1881. Imagine that Ferdinand de Lesseps had had access to the internet and Google and had been able to pull Carlos Finlay's discoveries into action in 1881. Instead, 1900, Walter Reed and his commission recognized that mosquitoes were the, were the carriers of yellow fever, properly referenced Carlos Finlay, recognized Finlay's brilliance. And as a result, when the U.S. began construction of the Panama Canal, they first brought mosquitoes under control, and the rest is history. History with global relevance. History that happened here, but of incredible importance globally. It's an export that Panama has for the world, and that science has. More famous than Carlos Finlay is Alexander Fleming. And Alexander Fleming said, when I woke up in the morning of September 28, 1928, I did not set out to revolutionize medicine with the discovery of the world's first antibiotic, the first bacteria killer. But surely that's exactly what I did. And this idea of revolution is incredibly important as we go forward. Again, remember, we're going from 7 billion to 9 billion people. And a lot of that action is in the tropical world. We don't understand enough about that tropical world. It is where change is happening. It is where we are going to have to pull science into action for human well-being. This is my office here in Panama. It was the office of my predecessor, Ira Rubinoff, for 34 years. As you walk into this office, you walk by bookshelves filled with books, books that Ira left me. But it's really not where the action happens. The action happens in these chairs right here. And I want to tell a short story. About 35 years ago, a scientist named Steve Hubble came in to this metaphorical office. The office has changed since. But came in and sat down with Ira Rubinoff. And he said, I want to pitch you an idea, a really important idea. I want to go out into this island in the middle of the Panama Canal and at a very large spatial scale, a spatial scale that nobody has ever attempted before, I want to count, measure, and identify every single tree in 50 hectares. He said, what people have lost sight of is they've moved into the tropics and brought the tools, the intellectual tools, of the temperate zone with them 
that the scale of the tropics is completely different than the temperate zone. We have more tree species on Barrow, Colorado Island, one small island in the middle of the Panama Canal, than the entire United States. Scale is different and scale is important. And Ira said, do it. Let's do it. It's going to be expensive. And Steve said, and we've got to do it over long periods of time. And so they, with a very simple question, why are there so many species of tropical trees, Steve Hubble, Robin Foster, Ira Rubinoff, set off to answer this question. They did their first census in 1980. They came back in 1985. And in 1985, what they noticed was that there was tremendous change. Nobody had anticipated this change. In fact, many people laughed at that group of people and said, what a colossal waste of money. Why would anybody do that? We know the tropics are stable. They're not dynamic. Well, they came back in 1985, recensed 300,000 trees, 300 species of trees, and saw remarkable change. Now, they were probably lucky. 1982, there was an El Nino event, tremendous drying, a lot of decline in trees that probably owed to uh, drought and a lack of drought tolerance. But the world took notice. The world took notice. Again, this was exporting knowledge, a theme of today's talk. What do, what do we have? We have knowledge. We need to get it out into the world. We need to put it into action. And as you can see from the dots on this map and the numbers below, the initial results from that study were so profound that around the tropical world at first, and now in the temperate world as well, people are mimicking that first experiment carried out on Barrow, Colorado Island. Now, what Steve Hubble didn't know, and again, this, this resonates on, the, on, on revolution, is Steve was interested in biodiversity dynamics. Why are there so many species of tropical trees? He wasn't really thinking about carbon dynamics, which of course, in a changing climate world, is something that we're all concerned about now. How much carbon in the atmosphere? How quickly is it changing? These graphs here show a plot in Panama and a part in, plot in Malaysia. Again, this carries forward this idea that we're looking at grand spatial scales and we're exporting our knowledge across the globe. And also on the, on the, on the horizontal axis, you see time. And you begin to understand the importance of being able to follow these types of observations through time. Through time across space. Scales of science that are rarely contemplated, rarely accomplished. Both of these graphs happen to show, through that time and across that spatial scale, a decline in the rate at which trees capture carbon from the atmosphere. Why is this important? Well, as you can see in these graphs, how trees take up carbon from the atmosphere is going to have an impact on how much carbon dioxide there is in the atmosphere when we get to 2100. If trees, because carbon basically acts as a fertilizer, if trees take up more carbon, then we'll be at this lower red line, which is good news. But if because of increasing temperatures, photosynthesis is interrupted, and trees take up carbon less rapidly, as I showed in the slide before, then you're going to get that dotted white line. And that's bad news. As it turns out, the difference between the red line and the white line dotted line intercepting at 2100 years. That's about 70 years of anthropogenic, human-caused carbon dioxide addition to the atmosphere. Right? So it makes a difference. Steve had not imagined this, but it turns out that these global plots are ideal for actually looking at those carbon dynamics in addition to species dynamics and across spatial and temporal scales that are relevant to us as humans and our future well-being. When you bring a group of brilliant scientists together, it attracts others. And one of, the one of the people that we've attracted to the tropics is somebody who's recognized in trees, it's not just about carbon. It's also about water. And in point of fact, if you go back to that previous graph, 
exactly how trees respond to increasing carbon dioxide is a complex interplay between carbon, temperature, water, soil fertility. You need to know all of these things. So we've set out, again, what we're about as scientists is we want to be on that intellectual edge. We want to be discovering new knowledge, pulling it into action. Again, Panama, remarkable place to do that. The Panama Canal, you see a ship going through her. 4.5% of global commerce. I did my own Google thing, not sure it's right, but according to Google, a year ago, about $18.2 trillion in trade globally. Do the arithmetic. That means that this canal is responsible for slightly over $800 billion of global trade. And it depends on fresh water. And you see on the, on the far shores there a mosaic landscape, some trees. Well, we typically think about planting trees to capture carbon, to create timber products, etc. We need to do better. We need to do something we call smart reforestation. We need to think about how trees respond not just to carbon, not just to temperature, but water, and then how that cycle works and how that cycle will play out in a place like the Panama Canal, not only important for global commerce, but obviously for the drinking water for 1.5 million Panamanians and energy as well. This is a story that is globally important. Watersheds around the world are of absolutely critical importance to human well-being. We need to understand them, and we need to get our science out. Here's an example of that science. And just very quickly, again, graphs. And what you're seeing here are two different comparable watersheds being graphed. One that's 50% deforested, shown in a line in red. One that's 100% that's forested, shown in a line in yellow. Those of you who are familiar with the dry and wet seasons in this part of the world will recognize that from September to December, when there's ample rain in this part of the world, in fact, it's the deforested landscape that is returning more water to the watershed. That's a time when, watershed, when, when infrastructure is at risk. Dams, locks, etc. Then in December, as we start to lose the rains and moving into March, April, when we're in the midst of the dry season, you see the curves um, um, cross. And in fact, it's the fully forested watershed that's returning water to the Panama Canal. But again, you can think about this globally. These are important considerations, both how we mitigate or reduce risk, and how we ensure that water is available at the times that we need it for agriculture, for drinking, for our well-being. We think about all of this as the economy of a rainforest. And I want to bring your attention to, many of you will recognize this little rodent, this agouti or nyeke. And I love this because it's showing a number of forest seeds here. This is the economy of a rainforest. Seeds are like the currency of a rainforest. And how do these seeds move around? What happens? And what does science tell us about this? So a really clever couple of people got together a number of years ago and figured, well, we can actually attach radio tags to these seeds, and we can follow their fate. We can follow the fate of currency, the forest currency, and see what happens. So this is going to take you through 365 days in the lives of seeds. And you see how they move about, a bit like money in, a, in an economy. And this becomes important in understanding, once again, how forests function. Not how, functions, not how forests function only for biodiversity, but also how forests function in the ways that that's important to our own human well-being. And it's a wonderful thing to be able to study something that's just intellectually cool, like biodiversity, but also to understand its relevance. So the way we get into all of this is through asking questions and recognizing that the thirst for knowledge is in our genes. This is a wonderful quote from E.O. Wilson. But it does remind us, we're all curious. We have a passion for learning, for new knowledge, for discovery. It's important, and we need to pull it into action. And one of the ways that we do that is through the questions we ask.
書いてる。